He's been on my show six times. And often when I come out to greet the audience before I do my show, they ask me, who's your favorite guest of all time? And I say, not just for volume, but it's Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> because not only uh, do I love what Neil knows, but uh, I love that he loves what he doesn't know. <laughs> always interested in the next thing to learn. Oh, yeah. And always roll to whatever idiocy my character wants to throw on him. <laughs> I think the only time I ever surprised you, as you told me tr a little while ago, uh, was uh, I asked you, should, uh, should scientists go to Argentina or hike the Appalachian Trail? <laughs> yeah, I, I want people to talk about them. <laughs> yeah, the universe talking yeah, there. I think that, we're a little there. The universe amplifies. Yeah, that one, what I, that, I missed that one. Yes, you'd miss that news story. Yeah. See, no. I, I, to go on a show... It's like the hardest interview ever. I have to like, I'm laden with current events just to mix with my science because I don't know where he's going to come at me. And I got to be like ready with seven tennis rackets to hit it back. And I'm upset because that one news story, remember what the guy, was it South Carolina guy? Who remembers? <laughs> He goes to Argentina and becomes well known for having done so. And yes. you asked me straight out, should scientists visit Argentina more often to become better known? And it just went, I just, you aced me on that one. You're welcome. Now, Neil, uh, we've got a lot to talk about tonight. Yeah. A lot of subjects. Science is a big thing. But I want to start off with, this is not a bribe. Okay. I want to start off with. Plus um, these chairs, I feel myself sliding. <laughs> no. Yeah. no exactly. It's like. This when you first walked in, I said, oh, welcome to the barn raising. <laughs> I realized we were speaking before the Amish tonight. <laughs> now it's going to make it tough to talk about science and technology. All right, Neil, I, I want to start, um, start in a, in a, in a broad way. Are you tweeting now, or are you actually trying to interview me? No, I'm just looking at, I'm just looking at photos of myself. <laughs> A little work done. I need a little freshen up. Now, let me ask you a very basic question. Mm -hmm. Science, mm -hmm. from sky, uh, scientia, Latin, meaning knowledge. I didn't take Latin, but I'll take your word for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Is it better to know or not to know? I think... Well, my blunt answer is it's better to know. All right. But that, I is, can, that, is, that is debatable, though. Uh, well, I said it's my answer. Yeah. I mean, somebody else might have a different answer. For instance, Oedipus might have a different answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... Is, is, is knowledge always a good thing? I have to say yes. Why? Because it empowers you to react and possibly even to do something about it if something about it needs to be done. Okay, but who we are is what we know, right? Would Part you, of who we are is what we know. And our identity mm -hmm. is often based on how we see the world. Yes, and our personality for sure. And if we learn something that does not jive with how we think about the world, won't we have to re-examine who we are? Yeah, it could mess you up. Again. Yeah. Once again, I'll go back to Oedipus. <laughs> he plucked his eyes out rather than know anymore. Yeah, the, well, back, you know, people back then, you know, they did stuff like that. Yeah, pe people back then, not people today. <laughs> um, so, so I think there's, you know, there are people who would not know, who, who would rather, I remember the old days, I don't know if it still happens, where the doctor would find out if you had cancer, they wouldn't tell you. They right. wouldn't tell you. Give and, it to me straight, Doc. Yeah, and it, why would you even have, have to say, give it to me straight, unless there was a day when they didn't give it to you straight? I'd like, if I have five years left, I want to know I have five years left. Because I'm going to, like, do something different in those five years. If I, Neil, yeah? I have some terrible news. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, but there are some people who don't want, there are, there, are, there are some people who don't value science. And if they don't value science... Are they valuing ignorance? Yes, and, but I will not pass judgment on them. What I will say is, if they are at maximal comfort in their ignorance, fine. Except that they will not be the participants on the frontier of cosmic discovery. They will be disenfranchised. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry, I've got a phone call. Hello? <laughs> Sorry, I have 
have to take. I have to take this. My mic isn't. My mic isn't working. Uh, now who's in control? So they won't be in control of the of the next one participate. No, no, they, they won't. Know, they won't. Not only will they not be on that frontier making any discoveries they're not in a position to enhance their life for having access to those discoveries themselves. Can knowledge ever be a bad thing? I don't think so. What about actions that knowledge takes us to? Do you think that Oppenheimer, when the bomb went off, and he said, I am become death, destroyer of worlds, do you think he perhaps questioned for a moment whether the knowledge they achieved that led to the creation of the bomb perhaps should have been left undiscovered? Do you know what he said in response to those kinds of questions? Yes. He said, because people said, Do you, have you usurped the power of God? Have you? And he said, if God didn't want this power to be there, he shouldn't have put it in the atom in the first place. Kind of an interesting <laughs> point, I think. Well, what are we saying is that the world is accessible to us. So would you say, don't smelt the ore and make iron and make a sword out of it because you could cut yourself. Back then, that's what you would, that's the counterpart statement from the Iron Age. And if you were around back then, you'd be sitting in this chair saying, don't make the sword because you'd unleash evil on the world. Okay, I'll, I'll step back from don't make the sword. How about don't lick the flagpole in February? <laughs> yeah, that, you will learn something. You will learn something, but at a price, Neil. That'd be data. It's a data cost. It is. Yeah. There is a data cost for that, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Also, Adam and Eve. The eight of the tree of knowledge of, knowledge. of good and evil. Yeah. And they paid a price. Yeah. So God does put things into atoms he doesn't want us to know about. <laughs> yeah. I, however, I think... Yes? I don't want to blame the knowledge. I want to blame the behavior of people in the presence of the knowledge. So maybe we need better knowledge management. Do you think that scientists go, you can applaud him, he's the, he's the, he's the hero. Well, how about, how about this? Do you think that scientists should be allowed to do anything they can? I heard a big no over there. <laughs> Someone just said no. You know, uh, people made fun of him for doing this, but uh, during one of President Bush's State of the Union speeches... Bush one or two? Uh, Bush two. Mm -hmm. um, he said uh, we have to... He spoke about... He warned against man-animal hybrids. Okay? <laughs> and a lot of people, like me, made fun of that by showing pictures of, like, Senator Alligator Man going, boo, boo, yay, man-animal hybrids. And, but if scientists could make man-animal hybrids, wouldn't they? There are scientists who want to make man-animal hybrids. Should we make man-animal hybrids? I ask you, Senator Tyson. <laughs> I have, there, should there be any limits like that? I think there's some creepy things about that, and I've met some scientists who, who would think that'd be an intriguing thing to do. Yes. Okay. Um, so no, I, I think we as a society, as a, as a, dem, as a democracy... <laughs> What we should do is come to some understanding of what the prevailing social mores are. And no, science should not cross those barriers. And, not, and by the way, scientists are often ones to try to prevent that. Einstein among them, for example. He didn't want to make the bomb after he first told Roosevelt he should make the bomb. He changed his mind because his conscience, his moral conscience, descended upon him. Scientists are not without moral code here. So as a culture and as a society, we decide what should be the prevailing cultural mores, and I think we should all be beholden to those. What do you think of the portrayal of scientists uh, in movies? Because often, often, for instance, the scientists who make... Um, uh, the Terminator. They're the bad guys. Scientists lead us to the Terminator, or they create the superbug that wipes out the world, or, or they uh, enrage the monster at the bottom of the sea. When you part the curtains, and, and at the bottom of all of that, there's a politician funding that research. <laughs> okay. Is this working again? It is? No, it's not. He says yes, you say no. Yeah, we got it. We're getting, we're getting bad data. <laughs> Is this 
Yeah. Trying to... We're good. That was good. That's good. You're good. Oh, yeah. You're good. You're good. <laughs> so scientists don't lead marching armies. Scientists don't invade other nations. Scientists, yes, we have scientists who, in, who invented the bomb. Yes, but somebody had to pay for the bomb, and that was taxpayers. That was war bonds. There was a political action that called for it. So everyone blames the scientists. We are collectively part of a society that is passing, that is, that is, that is using or not using to its benefit or to its detriment the discoveries made by science. And at the end of the day, a discovery itself is not moral. It's our application of it that takes that, that has to pass that test. Would you agree that there's a, there's a distrust of science on a certain level in our country? I mean, unless it's, you know, going to grow my hair back. Yeah, the right. science, or science... Or do other things to your anatomy, yes. Right, exactly. Yes. Science, exactly. Yeah. Science, I've gotten those emails. Science... <laughs> science is sometimes distrusted because it is, it is more complex than the average person can understand. I think that is the core of it. It's distrusted not because of what it can do, but because of what it because people don't understand how it does what it can do. And that, that absence of understanding or misunderstanding of the power of science is what makes people afraid of it. And so I remember back when they first split the atom. You know, shouldn't split the atom or shouldn't. I mean, you, you hear this at every discovery that happens in science. There's a mystery to it. For example, irradiated foods. In France, they call it frankenfood, all right? Which is kind of a cute word when you think about it. Yes. But it makes food last longer, and you're healthier for it. You don't get sick from it. And so for, from it turning bad. In fact, NASA does it all the time. NASA can make a slab of meat. You wouldn't necessarily put this in your refrigerator, but NASA can make a slab of meat that'll last 30 years. I tasted it. And? <laughs> Delicious? No, it was, you know, there's some, res it, it remi some restaurants food rem reminds me of what that tasted like. But I'm just saying that just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it's bad for you. Go figure out how it works. That's why we need a scientifically literate electorate so that when it, we go to the polls, you can make an informed judgment and you can draw your own conclusions rather than turning to a particular TV stations to have your conclusions handed to you. Now, uh, you know Arthur C. Clarke's... Comedy Central accepted. Exactly. Okay. You, you know Arthur C. Clarke's fa uh, famous uh, dictum about sufficiently advanced technology. Yes, it is. Arthur C. Clarke had several um, uh, uh, laws of yes. culture and, and the world, one of which was any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So, if something gets too complex for the average person to understand... It's magic. It's, it's like, magic. And you have powers that I don't trust, because I don't know what you're going to do with it next. Whereas if you understood how it worked, you'd say, hey, give me one of those. I mean, that's, that's how that would work. That's how that, that's how that plays out. Do you think that's where the debate over... I think that's where the debate over um, evolution and creation science comes, is that the complexity of evolution is so grand that it is hard to conceive of how the incremental changes come. And once something becomes so complex that I can't understand it, there's nothing between that and God saying, let it be. Well, one of the beauties of evolution is that that complexity does not come about from complex ideas. The ideas are actually quite simple. And you can show on a computer how those simple forces can generate complexity given enough time and enough uh, variation in environment, which is just what the history of the Earth <laughs> supplies. So, so science literacy is an important part of what it is to be an informed citizen of society. Let's get, let's get away from our understanding of science, or lack thereof, uh -huh. and get to science itself. Okay. Okay. I'm with you. Here's, uh, here's, a, here's a transition from talking about us mixing science and religion and getting back to science. Mm -hmm. God is truth. People think. Mm -hmm. Okay, some believe God is truth. Uh, truth is beauty. Is there anything in science to you that is beautiful? Or rather, what is the most beautiful thing that you know of in science? E equals MC squared. That's, really? Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> it is. So that equation doesn't just have a great publicist. It's actually... Oh, it because everybody knows it, everybody knows it, but also everybody knows Coke, you know? It's like right, the yeah. Coca-Cola of science. Yeah, you learn E equals MC squared before you even know what any of those symbols mean. You, you, you hear it in elementary school. 
Uh, it's a gorgeous thing. It's, it's what is beautiful about E equals MC squared? First of all, tell everybody what all the pieces mean. Well, E uh, stands for energy. M is mass. C squared is just the speed of light squared. That's just, ignore that for the moment. The thrust of that equation is that energy and mass are equivalent to each other, which means you can transmute one into the other and back. What makes it extraordinary is that that hardly ever happens in our everyday lives, yet it's going on all the time in the rest of the universe. And so... So, so we're in this little pocket where E equals MC squared never is not visible. It's not visible. It's not, it's not happening in our lives. No. No. But if it did, the world would be really different. Light coming from that bulb would all of a sudden pop into a particle, and the particle would come by and pop back into light again. Would it hurt? <laughs> it can, yeah. It, it would can? sterilize you. There's a lot of, yeah. The kinds of particles that would do that, that they would sterilize you, yeah. That'd be bad. I've had my kids. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes on in the center of the sun. It went on at the Big Bang. It goes on throughout the universe, wherever it's hot and heavy. It, that's what, but what is beautiful about it to you? It's simple. It's simple, yet it accounts for hugely complex things. And for me, that is where the beauty lies in the truth. No. If, if I had to give you a complex theory to understand a complex phenomenon, you know, send me home. Because what, what's the point? Why, now, I, now there's, no, there's no tablet in the sky that said it had to be simple to end up being complex. And it's a remarkable fact about the universe. So why not celebrate it? The fact that pi, pi, that... that Pi, pi, right? <laughs> let's, let's say the numbers together. 3.14159263. Well, we got a few That's over here. That's a nerd fact. That's what we got a geek thing going on over there. Not bad, that. not bad. The fact that you take a circle of any size, a circle the size of the universe itself, and divide it by its own radius, and you get that number, that's beautiful. I have to pause. And I, I get misty thinking of this. Yes. I'm sorry, that's, that's just that, another one. Another one. That the atoms and molecules in your body are traceable to the crucibles in the centers of stars that manufactured these elements over its lifespan, went unstable on death, exploding its enriched guts across the galaxy scattering it into gas clouds that would ultimately collapse and make a star and have the right ingredients to make planets and people. Which means we are part of this universe. As I've said many times, and this is, goes back, the, the, not only are we in the universe, the universe is in us. That is a profound concept. And it was, the, I think it's the greatest gift that astrophysics gave culture in the 20th century. It's a research paper in 1957, and I say that because one of the authors just died like two days ago, Jeff Burbage. Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle. One of the most famous research papers that no one ever heard of. You know why, I think? Because it had four authors, not just one, and it took a decade to figure out, and it wasn't just somebody burning the midnight oil, so it doesn't lend itself to poetry or screenplays because it's a collaboration, so nobody wrote about it. But we knew that we are star stuff. We knew that we are stardust at the middle of the 20th century that connects us to the universe like no other fact. That's beautiful. That sounds like you have written poetry about it. I've, well, it, once it gets in you, you have, you know, the only way it comes out is poetically. No! You some, write poetry. You write sonnets. I don't know if they're sonnets, but occasionally a word rhymes in it, and I, I don't know what to call it. But sometimes if, if you feel deeply about something, I think the greatest poetry, not that, I, not that I'm, you know, I'm an astrophysicist, right? That's my disclaimer. Mm -hmm. But some of the greatest poetry is revealing to the reader the beauty in something that was so simple you had taken it for granted. That, I think, is the job of the poet. And so the simplicity of the universe, which started this part of our conversation, I think if it doesn't drive you to poetry, it drives you to bask in the majesty of the cosmos. So what drew you? You said that this is 
the beauty of astrophysics or the gift that astrophysics gave us in the 20th century. What drew you to astrophysics? Take us to Neil deGrasse Tyson before he's an astrophysicist. Take us to who you are now. I'm living in the Bronx which in vernacular would be the Bronx. And I'm in a building... Not a lot of stars. No, there's like a dozen or so in the night sky. So you do not have a relationship with the night sky as a city dweller. And my parents, I have a brother and a sister, they would take us to... Each weekend we'd go to visit museums and other sort of cultural things in the city. And one of those weekends we went to the Hayden Planetarium. The local planetarium, the one right there in Manhattan. And I, you sit in the chair, and the, the lights dim, the stars come out, and I say, oh, that's a nice hoax, you know. That, I, that can't be real. That's a, that's, I'll enjoy it while there's it, but that fast. They think there's that many stars up there. I'm like, what kind of, are they pulling my leg? And a couple of years later, I go out to Pennsylvania in another trip that we took, and I looked up at the night sky, and, and what persists to this day, and what is an embarrassingly urban thought I look up at the night sky from the finest mountaintops in the world, and I look up and I say, it reminds me of the Hayden Planetarium. <laughs> it's embarrassing. See, I beg forgiveness. Wow. But so, wow. so strong was that imprint that I'm certain that I had no choice in the matter, that in fact the universe called me. And I wonder that if I'd grown up on a farm and the universe and the sky was just always there, I wonder if that would just have become wallpaper to me and I wouldn't have then been struck by it as I was at age nine. I'd never known anything of it. And then it just slaps you in the face. And from then on, I was hooked. It took two years for me to figure out you can do that as a career. But starting at age 11, you asked me, you know that annoying question adults ask kids? What do you want to be when you grow up? I heard a comedian say, you know why they ask? Because they're looking for ideas. <laughs> Because Paula Poundstone said that. Uh, so, um, if you had asked me from age 11, what do you want to be when you grow up, I would have told you flat out astrophysics, uh, astrophysicist. And, and my whole life aligned to that. Got a telescope, got a camera, photographed it, all my science fair projects. One was uh, getting the spectra of the sun and analyzing features in the spectra. I, 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 I built the spectroscope. So I was like nerd kid, total card carrying. <laughs> But I was bigger than other kids, so I was insulated from a lot of what might otherwise happen to nerd kids. But you wrestled, you wrestled too. I, re I was captain of my high school wrestling. I've team. seen you in that wrestling outfit. Oh. <laughs> you can rock a singlet. Well done. Now, singlet is what you call the one piece. Uh, they know. No, okay. <laughs> so. You, you, you became, you wanted to become an astrophysicist. That leads to another question, which is, you know, is it better to not to know? It's better to know. Um, can it be beautiful? Yes, it can be beautiful. Is science a thing, or is it a way to look at the world? It is, 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 it, is it a verb, or is it a noun? It is both. The world is not just, is it this or that? Is it a planet or not a planet? It's, it's sometimes... You must choose. It's fuzzier than that. Sometimes... So if I know, if I know, if I, have, if I have a lot of facts in my head, if I can absorb a lot of facts, facts. am I a scientist? No. No, you're, you're a fact memorizer. In fact, our I'll, I'll accept that as a compliment. Our, our academic system rewards people who know a lot of stuff, and generally we call those people smart. But at the end of the day... Who do you want? The person who could figure stuff out that they've never seen before, or the person who could rattle off a bunch of facts? At the end of the day, I want the person who could figure stuff out. And science... Say if we're trapped on an island. Exactly. Exactly. What, you know, the professor on Gilligan's Island? It's not a matter of how many facts he can recite. It's like, there's a coconut, and there's a thing, and you have a ham radio. That's, exactly. Okay? Because sea water, you get the salt water. water. You yeah. put the wires up to Gilligan's fillings, you know, and you listen to his ears. You listen in it. So it's an understanding of the relationships. While we're on it, Ginger or Marianne? Totally Ginger. <laughs> ginger. Complete. That was like, she came around the wrong time of my life. I'm dead. It was like, Ginger all the way. For sure. So it is a way, it is a way, it is, um... It's a way of approaching the world. It's a way, not only of approaching the world, it's a way of equipping yourself to interpret what happens in front of you. I think of science 
the methods and tools that enable it as kind of like a utility belt that you walk around with. You know, and you come upon something. Are you a superhero? Yeah, I can. in your mind, are you, are you super science? I, actually, when I was a kid, I, I wanted to be Mighty Mouse. When I was a kid, really, I wanted and I wanted to sing opera as I went Here to save. Here I am to save the day. Yeah, yeah. So it's a tool belt. It's a tool belt. It's a no, 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 no utility belt. Utility belt. Sorry, because I'm picturing, I'm picturing you in the singlet with the utility. Yeah, belt. yeah. It's the, a tool belt. The difference is a tool belt. You know, if you have a hammer. As they say, you can hammer in the morning. You yes. can hammer in the morning. If I had a hammer, mm -hmm. the problem is, if you start wielding a hammer, then all your problems look like nails, mm -hmm. and maybe they're not. Maybe it's more subtle than that. And so your toolkit has to be able to morph into what is necessary for what it is that you confront at that moment. And so, yes, there you're equipped with methods of mathematical analysis, methods of interpretation. You know some basic laws of physics. So when someone says, I have these two crystals, if you rub them together, you'll get healthy. So rather than just discount it, because that's, that's as lazy as accepting it, both of those are just lazy brain. What you should do is inquire. So do you know how to inquire? And every scientist would know how to start that conversation. They would say, well, where'd you get these? What kinds of ailments does it cure? How does it work? What does it cost? Can you demonstrate that it works? And you go through this whole, and at the end, the person's in tears because they weren't prepared for that level of questioning. And so science literacy is vaccine against charlatans of the world that would exploit your ignorance of the forces of nature. Neil, if you don't like the crystals I gave you, you can just say <laughs> And they're not working for you because you don't believe. <laughs> Is there any science fiction you admire, or that you enjoy, or do you see the holes in science fiction and go, I can't enjoy that? Of course he would know the effects of a neutron star. He doesn't know tidal forces? <laughs> like, do, you, do you have that problem? Do you have that problem? I only have the problem if the movie is marketed for its accuracy. Number one. Number two, they got to get some basic science right. After that, I'm okay. So, for example, in the latest Star Trek movie, they had this, like, this red, this, this liquid. The red matter. The red matter, thank you. Release the red matter. Release the red matter, and you drop it into the core of a planet, and it turns a planet into a black hole? I thought that's kind of cool. <laughs> what was a little weird was, why didn't it turn the ship into a black no, hole? No, 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 because they had the special apparatus that surrounded it. The, the apparatus device. did what? It, it's the anti-black hole apparatus. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. See, see, I was not losing sleep. That didn't bug you? Over what held the black hole. I didn't have an issue with that. But oddly, what I had an issue with was they needed this drill, which was a very cool kind of, that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Exactly. A drill that would drill to the center of, the, of the, your planet, and they dropped the, I'd say, if that would turn a planet into a black hole from its center, it surely would turn a black hole, in, turn into a black hole from its surface. <laughs> So you but just drop them That would, that would Kirk and Sulu fight on. I know, right. They have to fight on the platform. So I'm okay. I'm just, I, I, I got angry with Jim Cameron in, in, about Titanic. That's how I got angry. Did I tell you? I never tell you the story. You did not. Oh, no. Can, can I, can I, I've never seen you this angry before. <laughs> hold me back. I can't wait to see what you have to say about Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> you might turn blue with rage. Go <laughs> on. So what was the problem with Titanic? There's a, there's a colleague of mine who saw Avatar, and he got home, and he, he told his wife he wanted to paint her blue, and that didn't go over very well. <laughs> Is she 10 feet tall? <laughs> so... Titanic, you may remember, was marketed as a film of high accuracy because Cameron had funded this submersible to go down and, and it checked out the, the state rooms and the wall sconces and the china patterns. And so they reproduced that to detail. And so here they recreate the ship for the movie. Can you double check that? No, because he had the submersible. You just have to trust him, okay? No, you gotta trust him. So now, the ship sinks, yes. right? Did I give away the... <laughs> The movie yet? I'm sorry. Okay, so the ship sinks. I do, I remember. You remember that, okay? Very sad. And it's Kate Winslet on the, on the flow. Remember that? And yes. she's, a little, she's delirious. This isn't the scene where she's naked. Oh, sorry. Go on, she's dressed. Okay, go ahead. No, she's on the flow, on the, on the, on the whatever, the plank. And, all right, she's looking up. 
We know the day, the day, the time, the weather conditions, the longitude, the latitude. We know all of this about the sinking spot of the Titanic. There is only one sky she should have been looking at, and it was the wrong sky. <laughs> Worse, worse than that, worse than that, the left side of the sky was a mirror reflection of the right side of the sky. So it was not only wrong, it was lazy. And I so halfway through, they just went, just flip it, just flip oh, it. No one will know. And so I was livid. Ooh. I got out my finest stationery, and I wrote a letter to Jim Cameron. No reply. Five years later, I bump into him. He was on the NASA committee. And my sort of presence with NASA was growing by then. But I bumped into him in a meeting. And I said, Mr. Cameron, I just want to, I just have to ask. You know, the sky that was, is not the right, it's black, what, what? And he says, well, actually that happened in post-production. So, so he's absolving himself of guilt. But I wanted him to grovel in front of my feet, which he did not do. Now, wait, 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 wait. So I was angrier after that. Later on, Wired Magazine honors him for Discoverer of the Year, Explorer of the Year, and they want to hold their party at the Rose Center for Earth and Space. <laughs> you don't come into my house and get the sky wrong. Okay. <laughs> Am I, my microphone working? Fall. You're loud enough, you don't need a microphone. <laughs> there we go, I fell down. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, He's in my house. And as a courtesy, they extended me an invitation to have dinner with a small group of them after this award ceremony. So I said, yeah. So we go to dinner. There's six of us at the table. The wine is pouring. <laughs> so I said, Jim, I don't know if you remember, but I brought this up some time ago about the sky. And I wouldn't be so upset, except that everything else you boasted was so accurate. And we can't even check how accurate that is, but anybody can spend $50 for a planetarium sky program and look at the sky and know that you got the wrong sky. What gives? And you know what he said? He said, last I checked, worldwide, Titanic has grossed $1.3 billion. Imagine how much more it would have grossed if I got in the sky right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, if I had a tail, it would have been like between my legs, and I would have, and oh, so no, I, I think you won that conversation. No, actually I did. He, he retreated into his bank account. <laughs> Here's what but, you know, but that money will all eventually be gone, and he would still have gotten the sky wrong. Oh, that's an interesting point. That's right. The sky will ever, outlive will, even James Cameron. <laughs> however, however, as dejected as I was, two weeks later, I get a phone call. Forgot the guy's name. He calls me up and says, hello, is Dr. Tyson? I said, yes. He said, this is, I forgot his name, Johnny Smith. I work in post-production for Jim Cameron. He is releasing a 10-year director's cut anniversary edition of the Titanic, and will be adding new footage from the deck. And he tells me, you have a sky that he can use. <laughs> You got so, your taste, right? You I, got a little taste. Yeah, it was, right? it was good. Oh, no, no, I'm not. I was, I, I'm, a, I'm a public servant. Me too. <laughs> so I don't, I, you know, if you're going to make, if you're going to claim it's right, then I'm going to hold you to it. If you're not, then I'll just sit back and enjoy it. What well, is you know what late? I don't like? I got to, you know what I don't like? I is the people who you go see a movie with who read the book first. Get rid of them. They don't belong in the movie theater. All right? It's like, oh, that would, no, the book was better. They're, well, get the hell out of it. Get out of the movie theater. Then go back to your book. Leave me alone. Those people I can't stand. Stay home. We should not go to the movies together. <laughs> now, okay, what is the, what is, I got three different things. What is the latest discovery in astrophysics that we should all know about? Uh, one of my favorite. I got to go back maybe six months for that, eight months, may I? Uh, is, um, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, we discovered water on the moon, that's kind of cool, because where you're going, you want there to be water, all right? That's a good thing for life. But what struck me the most earlier in, in 2009, we discovered 
methane on Mars. Methane. If you have a gas stove and you live in a city, chances are it's methane. It's a flammable gas. You say, well, so what? Who cares? Except that methane is the byproduct. It's, it's, it's a part of the, of the gaseous effluences of anaerobic bacteria, which on Earth operates deep in the intestinal tract of farm animals. That's a very scientific way of saying <laughs> there are Mars farts. <laughs> You're saying, I right? didn't want to say. Yeah, I didn't. You got a doctor in front of your name. You can't say stuff. I like can't that. say stuff like that. But that means that 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 is possibility, or is that, or is that? Yeah, there's life, but no one will come out and say it. It means while you can generate methane other ways, such as uh, well, it's sunlight. It's it's a, it's, it's, it's a, there, a combination of pressure, temperature, and energy source. You can manufacture methane. Magic. Right? So, but. <laughs> Chemical magic, yeah. Chemical magic. But it is a natural byproduct of bacteria that thrive in the absence of oxygen. And you don't have oxygen deep in your intestinal tract, neither do any farm animals. And, and if you're down under the... And Mars doesn't have oxygen. So it's tantalizing to think that maybe there is there are life reservoirs in aquifers beneath the Martian soils. Speak, well, as I was saying before about is it better to know or not to know, and there are things about our own identity that we take from the knowledge that we have, yes, we or, the things that we, or the things that we don't know, the assumptions of things that are not there to be known. And I, instead thing. of using the word identity, I'd say they have an impact on our ego. Because yes. the more we learn about the universe, the smaller we get, mm -hmm. right? In time, in space, in size, and so if you Except go not, in... Not the way you just described it. The way you described it, you're a supernova. Well, that I th makes you bigger. Well, I think if you know about what's going on, then it's not mysterious and you're a participant in the unfolding cosmos. Otherwise, you are consumed by it and you fear it and you shun it and you say, I don't want to know that I live on a speck called Earth orbiting an undistinguished star in the corner of an ordinary galaxy in an expanding void of the cosmos. There are some happy thoughts in there, like, like understanding how that worked, recognizing that the human brain figured that out. That's kind of cool. There's a lot we still don't know, but what we do know, I think we can sit proudly and celebrate what we know about the universe. Maybe Now, not every one of us figured it, it took a few key people like Newton and Einstein, and, but, but we learned what they taught us, and the, each of them stands on the soldiers of giants that came before them, just as the quote goes. Let's celebrate it, not fear it. But if we found out that there was life someplace other than Earth, what do you think that would do to our identity it, or our ego? It may signal a change in the human condition that we cannot foresee or imagine. I think it would. Now, I think the issue would be not if we find bacterial life, which is kind of what's what we're looking for now. Bacterial life... There's no question about whether, in our mind's eye, we reign supreme over bacteria. Although... It can win. Bacteria... Do you know in one linear centimeter of your lower colon lives and works more bacteria than the number of people who have ever been born in the history of the world? So, in fact, we are just hosts for bacteria to lead their lives. So, from the point of view of a bacteria, we are, we, we're just a place to live. A, a, a dark, warm place to live. But we're, we're a planet, and they don't believe there's bacteria in any of the other planets. <laughs> right, that'd, be another, that'd be an interesting sci-fi yeah. model. So the real issue is, if we find life on another planet that's smarter than we are, that would totally mess with our ego. That'd be the last like nail in the coffin of our ego. That used to be, well, we're humans, and we're on Earth, and Earth is small, and the sun, sun is insignificant. We, that'd be the last one, and I don't know how we'd be able to handle that. Do you think that there have been discoveries that have happened? For instance, I have heard discoveries that have changed our point of view about the universe that we are not aware of that they've changed. In other words, the change has been so gradual, we don't realize we see the world differently. Has E equals MC squared because... That's coming up on 100 years? I'll tell you. Yes, it is, actually. Well, no, we're past the age. Last 19, year was 100? No, 1905, so 2005. Okay. But so I got has, one that, has that changed us? I got one for you. I got one for you. In the 1920s, which was a watershed decade in the history of science, in that decade, we discovered that 
not only our galaxy, the Milky Way, is not the only existence of anything in the universe, that there are other Milky Ways out there. That recently? 1920s. Did, was it just the op- optics didn't exist for that? We needed a big enough telescope, and Edwin Hubble wielded all the glass that necessary to accomplish that back in the 1920s. He said Hubble, before the telescope, was a man and, <laughs> and had his own telescope, the biggest of its day, and he made that discovery that there were these spiral fuzzy things in the night sky, we thought they were just local to us, the whole other systems of stars, 100 billion stars unto itself, outside of our system. Not only was that discovered in 1926, 1929 he discovers that the universe is expanding, which means it may have had a big, back then, it may have had a beginning. If it's expanding, that meant it was littler in the past. Well, there must have been a day when it was all together in the same place, thus was born the Big Bang. Okay, so now, also in that decade, quantum quantum mechanics, quantum physics was discovered. That is the science of the small, the science of electrons, protons, neutrons, particles, nuclei. At the time, you'd say, this is just the, this is just physicist burning tax money. Because who cares about the atom? I got my horse to feed. I got kids, I got, you know, you got issues in society. Yet it's quantum mechanics that is the entire foundation of our technological revolution. There would be no computers. There would be no, there would be none of what you take for granted. Your iPod, your iPhone, cell phones, the space program, without our understanding of the laws of physics as they operate on that atomic and molecular and nuclear level. And so the the, the chemist has no understanding of the periodic table of elements without quantum mechanics. To them, it's just a list of elements. Quantum mechanics tells you why this column is there, and that's there, and why this mates with that, and why that makes a molecule with that. That's quantum mechanics, and it's unheralded. You ask me, is there any discovery that has changed how we live? It is quantum mechanics. And I make, I make this point because I'm ready to... Today, you hear people saying, why are we spending money up there and we've we got problems on Earth? And, we, and people don't connect. The time delay between the frontier of scientific research and how that's going to transform your life later down the line. So they, all they want is a quarterly report that shows the product that comes out of it. That is so short-sighted that that's the beginning of the end of your culture. So it's... So it's better... So it's better to know. <laughs> That's a really long answer to my first question. My second question is, let's take some questions. Do we have time to do that? Q&A. You about to, you know, you about to wave, you about to hit me in the head with a rubber band. Okay. Very quickly, before we get to questions here. How many can I, how many can I ask? <laughs> ask one. Do we have microphones, or are we going around the room? We can repeat the question if there aren't enough microphones to go uh, around. Let's start right here. Just one, please, sir. Is there a brown dwarf star approaching? Is there a brown dwarf star approaching? Okay, uh, dare I suggest that I think I know much more deeply about what's behind that question? He's, he's asking about planet X that would swing by Earth in the year 2012 and tip us on our axis and have it be the end of civilization as we know it. Is that right, sir? Oh, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm digging a subterranean chamber. Yeah, yeah. Me and my kids are going to be fine. <laughs> yeah, go on. Once again here. Uh, it doesn't exist. I'm moving on. Next <laughs> yeah, yes. No, there is no planet X. All gravity, all principal sources of gravity in the solar system are present and accounted for. And you yes, can discover now are tiny and insignificant, like Pluto's relatives. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. Can you say about um, Apophis? Apophis. Apophis, an asteroid the size of the Rose Bowl, discovered December 2004, headed towards Earth. It's not alone among asteroids headed towards Earth, except that this one is headed, excuse me, there's a whole set of asteroids that cross Earth's orbit. That alone is not a problem. You cross the street all the time, but at different times the trucks drive by, okay? So the issue is, are you crossing the street when the truck is driving there at the same moment? That simultaneity is what matters. Apophis, when you ran the calculations, showed that there was a chance of it hitting us in the year 2036, with a close approach in the year 2029 on April 13th, a Friday, by the way. And, but here's what's significant about that. We've had close approaches before, but none this close. 
This is the size of the Rose Bowl, and in, on April 13, 2029, it'll come close enough to Earth to dip below our orbiting communication satellites. Do you think 2.5% is a big number for that asteroid to come to Earth? No, the, the, right now the best estimates are several in a million that it will hit us in 2036. And if it does, it will likely hit the Pacific Ocean, plunge into a depth of three miles, explode, cavitate the ocean, send waves of tsunamis, the first one from the impact, the second one because the water splashes back into the cavity, goes high into the air, drops back down and sends another pulse. This will go on about 40 times. There'll be multiple tsunamis. I was just on the Santa Monica beach two nights ago because Santa Monica is the first city to get hit because it's it's the beeline right up from Santa Monica, 600 kilometers into the Pacific. Five-story tall tsunami would take out the entire west coast of the United States. But nobody has to die, because we know this well in advance. And, but I think two people will die. The, the stupid surfer who wants to surf that tsunami, you know, we know people like this, right? You know, you see them. And you know who else, of course, the, the, the weatherman who wants to bring the camera guy closer. Can you see the waves hitting the shore? Okay, take him out too. We don't need either one of them, and then we'll get on with right. that. That would be a great James Cameron movie. <laughs> uh, yes. Tonight there's a wolf moon. Can you explain what that means? What's a wolf moon? Okay, each full moon of the year has a name, and and, depend, and there are regional variations among those names. And the wolf moon, it's when it's snowy and the wolves howl. You can see the wolf in the light of the moon because it's all the landscape is white. And the wolf doesn't, the wolves don't turn white, so you can see them against this. And so, depending on where, if you live in a region where there are wolves, that would be what you would call it. Other full moon names you've heard of, the harvest moon is one of them, the, uh, the honeymoon is one. That's the, the moon that's in June, the honeymoon, because that moon actually never gets very high in the sky. And it, it's amber the entire time, it takes on the color of honey. It's just called the honeymoon, and you get married in June, and that's where you get the name honeymoon nice. for that. Yeah. Anyone over here? No? Yes, sir. <laughs> um, the, I, I think, you know, in astronomy, probably dark energy was sort of a real game changer about 10 years ago, the discovery that the expansion of the universe is speeding up. If there's a game changer in the next 20 years, what is it? Uh, the question is, uh, dark, dark energy, he said 10 years ago was like a game changer. Can I foresee any game changers on the horizon? Well, it turns out dark energy was not as much of a game changer as you might think. Because that dis we already had a slot for it in Einstein's equations. We already had a placeholder. No one had ever measured it before. So we just assumed it was zero and got on with life. The moment it was discovered, we said, hey, now we can stick it in the equation. It's like, whoa. Its presence in the equation shows that there's this force, this is pressure operating against the action of gravity, making the universe accelerate in its expansion. And that's extraordinary, because it means that a day will come where these galaxies that Hubble discovered will, expand, will move away from us with such speed that they will disappear beyond our horizon, and the total known universe at that time will only be the Milky Way, restoring the state of mind of our universe that existed before 1920. <laughs> That's a spooky time. We would have to hand down the annals of cosmology from previous centuries to hear about the galaxies that were once in the night sky. So game changers going forward. If we discover the dark matter particle, that'd be kind of cool. If, we, if dark energy and dark matter, because we don't know what's causing either one of them, but we measure them. So they are real in their action on the universe. We just don't know what, they're, what, the, what it is, okay? As distinct from the ether 100 years ago, we never measured it, we just assumed it was there, there was no data, it was just a, a we, dark matter, dark energy, we can call it Fred and Wilma. Don't think it's matter or energy, we don't know what it is. Don't let the name fool you. I'll for henceforth call it Fred and Wilma, okay? So, with Fred and Wilma, these two things, it may be a game changer, we, once we figure out what it is, it's a new particle, that then we can exploit to our benefit in the same way our understanding of quantum physics enabled us to exploit the behavior of atoms and nuclei to our benefit. So a new kind of physics would transform how we live. Yes? That's one way I think it might be. Yeah. Do you know 
going to be uh, uh, excised, so, so not just because you send it out, but because <laughs> the ice will expire quickly. Well, will Pluto not only be humiliated by Neil deGrasse Tyson? <laughs> you may not That's know not this. That's not the word she said. She said word. Excised from, uh, from the, the family of planets. Neil was on the group that uh, gave the recommendation that Pluto be demoted, correct? We, uh, we, we thought differently about Pluto's identity than Pluto did. Mm -hmm and other supporters of it. We just grouped it with other icy bodies in the outer solar system that at the time were being discovered. Mm -hmm. you, know, don't, you know, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> Pluto was alone for 65 years, and so you can't have a, ca a, ca a category of one. You, that doesn't work in science. You need a few things to make a category. So he's okay. It wasn't a category, though. It was a planet. Well, yeah. My like... very elegant mother just sat upon nine porcupine. <laughs> now, now she just sits upon nine. It doesn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Where's the porcupine? If she's that elegant, she wouldn't have sat on a porcupine, I don't think. Uh, but, so, once we found other icy bodies, we, well, all we did was group them together. We, did, we said, Pluto, we found family for you. In fact, we think you're happier there, because now you're one of the biggest icy bodies. And I, rather than a pipsqueak planet. You I, sent Pluto to a farm upstate to run and chase rabbits. <laughs> it's much happier there, kids. It's, it's, it's happier there. And I didn't do this is alone. There, is there a supergiant beyond Pluto that, that pulls comets in? Is there, is, there, is there a chance there's something out there that's drawing? There was a hypothetical star, which is related a little bit to what led to this invention of this the brown dwarf that the, the you won't talk about but you and I know yes yeah. uh, there was a, come down to the bunker too <laughs> there was a suggestion that there was a companion star to the sun provi uh, provisionally called Nemesis that would have this long orbit that would jostle comets in the outer solar system and send them raining down on earth creating mass extinctions accounting for the extinction episodes in the fossil record but the it was an interesting hypothesis that was never supported by data. And so when you're not supported by data, you discard the hypothesis. That's how science works. You don't believe something just because you want to or think something's true just because it feels good. At some point, you've got to confront the data. So getting back to the so point. You've, ne you've never been in politics. <laughs> so getting back to the point, the recognition that Pluto has made half ice and ice evaporates, so will Pluto one day disappear? No, Pluto's too far away from the sun for that to ever meaningfully evaporate and disappear completely. Yes? What was the plan, did you the say? Point. The point. Of what, the point. What Hadron was collider. the point? He speaks in past tense as though we're done with it. <laughs> well, we what just is? turned on the switch, the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. The point of the Large Hadron Collider was to embarrass America, to make us feel bad that we didn't have our collider built back in the 1980s when it was first funded. That's the whole point of the Large Hadron Collider. It's Europe saying, ah, got you this time. Now, apart from that ego bit, uh, it's to pro nature on levels of energy never before seen. And right now, it's hard, it's practically impossible to discover a new law of physics on your tabletop. We've been there. We've done that. And almost the entire history of physics is go to the edges of your points of exploration and then take a step beyond that. You're bound to discover something new. It's like climbing the next mountain, crossing the next valley. So, the Large Hadron Collider, the energy inside that particle accelerator will exceed the energy of all accelerators that have ever been built before. Probing nature as never uh, previously imagined. What is the Higgs boson? Higgs boson, that's a particle proposed that you can think of it as a kind of a, it's like a, <laughs> think of it like molasses. <laughs> Okay? Uh, well, okay, not molasses. Um, <laughs> it's a field through which all particles move, and the interaction of those particles with that field endows them with the mass that we measure for them. It is granting them the property of mass. We have yet to find this particle, but if we do... So mass is not explained presently. That's correct. We just measure... We it. don't know why we get fat. 
<laughs> we don't know. We don't know why something has mass right now. That's correct. And so we now. Now let me ask you something. If you have, if you build, uh, let's say you, you build an equation this way. You, you've got an equation over here. You built it, and it's a house. Okay. And you've got another equation over here that works. It's another house. But in your mind, you think uh, these two houses are actually probably should be one house. You invent the. Sh you invent something that fits into the shape between the two houses, right? Yes. Like you've got a shape between the houses. Okay, there's something in the universe that is the shape of the space between these two houses. Yes. Does that necessarily mean that thing is there? The history has shown that almost every time we propose something that connects one house to another, if those two houses themselves work, there's something in between them connecting the two. For example, for example, in 1930s, we had this experiment with, it's, 1930s, quantum physics is in place. We start probing the atom. We find out there's, a, there's, an, there's, a, there's, a, there's an atomic reaction, a nuclear reaction, where there's some missing energy. We account for all that, and there's something missing. It's, we said this much energy here, and then it's, it's missing here. <laughs> and we swear we accounted for energy, everything. Fermi comes up, a famous physicist, said, I bet there's a particle that came out of that reaction that escaped with the energy before you had a ch chance to measure it. E equals mc squared. Oh, well, that would have endowed that particle with its energy to do so, the mass to do so. And, and even, you know, mc squared is in every one of these. It's all over the place. It's written with e equals mc squared. The point is, he hypothesized the particle, gave it the properties that it would have to have to account for what was seen. That's your, that's your conduit between the two houses. Then he says it's got to have this much energy, and it's got to be pretty hard to detect because we sur surrounded this in lead, and it just got, went straight through the lead. So I'm going to propose a particle that's hard to detect. And it's got to be little because it's not that much mass, and it has no charge, so it's neutral. So he called them neutrinos, little neutral ones. He hypothesized. He said, let's look for them. 20 years later, they were found, neutrinos. And now we kept them coming out of these reactions. He built, he built the, the porch, the, 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 the walkway between the two houses. Practically every time you have two working understandings of the world, and they have to coexist in the same universe, there's something that's going to connect them. It's like electricity and magnetism, previously discovered as separate things, until Faraday and Maxwell said, hey, wait a minute. This works and that works, and they kind of smell like each other a little. Maybe they're the same thing. So a whole theory came out to put the two together, and it is the theory of electromagnetism. You know this word. You just take it as a, as a single word, but those used to be separate concepts. So we're going good with this, with this uh, with, we're, we're on a roll here. So why not continue? Yes, right. Uh, do parallel universes exist? Do parallel universes exist? We don't know. Um, the parallel universes are losing favor to the multiverse. We have some cogent theoretical expectations that our universe might be just one of many spawned from this sort of this hyperdimensional medium, which we'll call the multiverse. There's no data to support it, but we have good theoretical um, premise to think that it's there. And we have philosophical precedent. We used to think Earth was special and unique. It wasn't. We got eight, nine, eight planets. We, think that we thought the sun was special. It's one of 100 billion suns. Thought the galaxy was special. No, it's 100 billion galaxies. We have one universe. Or, or do we? <laughs> the track record said, why should there only be one? Be open to the possibility that you don't live in the majority looking universe that's out there. Would a separate universe, when you say different universe, different, does that mean, slight, Slightly different laws of physics, which makes that's it... That's what I'm asking. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, this is, the, this is the fun part. Because if you, find, if you manage to get a portal to another universe, don't be the first one to volunteer to go through it. Because you know, you're, you, you, your atoms are working in this universe. If the slightly different law of physics, yeah. you could implode, explode, come out with three heads. Who knows? There's a different exchange rate over there. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Someone. I'll just go in the back, in the middle, and I think you have a white sweater on, yes. Um, is it possible to tunnel through a black hole, like, quantum mechanically? 
Can a black hole be used to travel? How about that? Can we say that? No, no, it's a little different. Like, <laughs> Steve, get, can with, you get with the get program. Get with it. Tunnel through a black hole yes. quantum as if it creates a tunnel in space or time. Quantum mechanically is what you say. Quantum mechanically, can you tunnel through a black hole? I'm not going to try to interpret this one. <laughs> Uh, well, I have to ask, did you want to land someplace else when you're done, or are you content with being dead when it's over? <laughs> I need to know before I answer. I guess it's okay if I die. It's okay if you die. Um, for science. For science. Stephen Hawking showed just recently that, and for me this was kind of spooky amazing, that black holes remember everything that they have ever eaten which means it's not a tunnel to anywhere. Everything that it ate is sitting there at the singularity at its center. Now the spooky part, that's not the spooky part. The spooky part is, Stephen Hawking showed 40 years ago that black holes can actually evaporate. The matter that's within a black hole can rise up out of the gravitational field that surrounds it and spontaneously birth a pair of particles. That's just E equals MC squared doing its thing. E equals MC squared. The, it, the gravity field has high energy density. Out of that pops particles. And those particles escape, taking matter away from the black hole. From the, from the gravity field of the black hole. Doesn't that fly in the face of what we, how we think of a black hole? Yes. A black hole, gone forever. It, it, because nothing escapes, because nothing, nothing can uh, surpass the energy needed to go faster than the speed of light. Except quantum mechanics... This quantum physics from the 1920s gets you out of that problem. That's a classical understanding of black holes. You layer quantum mechanics on it, weird stuff happens. Completely legitimately weird stuff happens. So you birth these particles outside the thing. Now here's what happens. I dump you. That sounds like that. I'm not interrupting. That sounds like a science is making magical exceptions for itself. <laughs> it quantum physics is kind of magic. Because none of it issues forth from your common sense. Particles pop in and out of existence. One time it's a wave, the next time it's a particle. And it interacts with itself. And, pop, and, and you measure it here, but it shows up there. If we were forged in that world, then all that would be common sense. And equals MC squared would be a, da a daily phenomenon. You wouldn't need Einstein to figure it out. He'd be learning it in elementary school. But that is a foreign universe to us. And so what goes on there, you are prone to say, that doesn't make sense. You know something? It's of no, no obligation to make sense to you because your senses didn't come out of that universe, out of that universe of tiny particles. We don't live there. If you let something go and it drops, you say, that makes sense. If you let something go and it goes up, you say, that doesn't make sense. In quantum world, that happens all the time. It would make sense in the quantum world. So I submit to you, that if I take your body and dump it into a black hole, what Stephen Hawking showed is that all the particles that went into the black hole, let's say it's Stephen Colbert black hole, okay? No other contaminating bodies but your atoms in the center of this black hole. And I wait around, and out here in the gravity field, particles pop into existence. And I check, make a check, how many protons, how many neutrons, how many electrons, how many neutrinos. By the time this black hole is evaporated, it would have been every single particle that you were having fallen in in the first place. Extracted out of the energy field of the black hole. So it remembers who you were even out in, in the gravitational field. That's spooky to me. <laughs> I, I'm Is the so black hole now gone? Gone. Gone. Just it pops out of existence. Evaporated. It takes, by the way, it takes several trillion years for that. So don't wait around for it. It's that young man right there. How do you figure all this out? <laughs> okay. How do you figure all this out? Uh, That's an excellent question. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, yeah. Isaac Newton did it all by himself. He was like really, really, really smart. A quick Isaac Newton story. He discovered, he discovered laws of motion, laws of gravity. Just shows that planets don't orbit in circles as Copernicus had thought, but in slightly flattened circles we call ellipses. And, and so a friend of his said, Ike, why? That may be quite a little bit. Ike, why, why that shape and not some other shape? <laughs> he couldn't answer that question. He's, I'll get back to you. Goes home for two months, comes back. Here's why it's that shape. They're conic sections that cuts through the thing. They said, well, how did you figure that out? He said, well, I had to invent integral and differential calculus to figure it out. <laughs> 
So some people invent their own tools and methods to discover the world. Most people learn the tools from someone else and then apply them to make incremental changes. Some people make huge changes, like Isaac Newton and, 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 and Einstein and, and others. Isaac Newton once said, if I can see farther than others, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants who have come before me. But I've read Isaac Newton, and his stuff makes the hair on the, if I had hair, it would rise up on the back of my neck, how plugged in he was to the universe. And I'm saying to myself, that quote cannot have possibly have been honest. What it really meant, if I, I, I give that quote to him, I'd say, if I can see farther than others, it's because I'm standing among, uh, among midgets, that's why. He can see farther than everybody else. In the case of Isaac Newton. I'm afraid we only have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, that was a great segue to my question. You talked we we organized this all for your question. <laughs> sir. The, the ideas of scientific literacy and technology management. I'd like to hear your opinions on where the policy needs to go to make a positive impact in that area. Ooh. All right, Neil. Can you repeat that for everybody? <laughs> the question is, we were talking earlier about scientific literacy and our approach towards science uh, as a nation. In your opinion, and you, you serve on science advisory panels, yeah. where do you think we need to go as a nation? What do we need to do to increase our scientific literacy? Uh, to, I'll, go, I'll answer two prompt. One is, what do you do with your kids? And kids need to be able to explore freely. And if you look at most households, they're not designed for that. They're designed to have the kid not explore. The kid comes into your kitchen and pulls out the pots and pans and starts banging them. What's the first thing you do as a parent? Stop that, you're getting the dishes dirty. Yet these are experiments in acoustics. That's what that is, okay? Whatever the kid is doing, if it has the chance of breaking something, you're gonna tell them to not do it without thinking that that's the consequence of an experiment that they are conducting. And every time the kid wants to do something, provided it doesn't kill them, it's an experiment. Let it run its course even if it makes something messy. You agreed to have a kid in the first place? Fine, clean up after them. And when, when they're old enough... <laughs> because it's those seeds of curiosity that is the foundation of what it is to become a scientist. Now, I don't want everybody to be a scientist. That'd be a boring world. I want the poets and I want the musicians and the, I, 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 we need that, and I don't have a, but I'm talking about promoting science literacy. And so the first step for the parent is to get out of the way. Allow the child to explore. They, they start playing in the mud, don't do that in the mud, I just cleaned those pits. You're getting in the way of another experiment. They start plucking the petals off the flowers you just bought from the, from the florist, and you say, stop that, I just paid $10 for the flowers. Had you let that continue, they'd find in the middle the stamen and the pistol, and they'd learn something about the flower. For 10 bucks! That's cheap! <laughs> Derek Bach, one time president of Harvard, once said, if you think education is expensive, try the cost of ignorance. <laughs> and so that's, so that's got to start at home. In the schools, I don't have a problem with the fact memorizing. But don't equate that with what it is to be wise or what it is to be smart. Smart should be some combination of that, yes, but also what is your lens on the world? How do you figure things out? And you promote that by stimulating curiosity. And I don't see enough stimulated curiosity in this world. This is a famous school right here. I saw the banner in the opening corridors. So you probably don't have that problem here. All right? But the whole world is not educated in this building. So a lot of change would need to happen in that regard. Now getting back to policy, I have tried. You do a simple Google, like YouTube and Tyson, my name, but put Neil so you don't get Mike. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> dining on someone's ear. You, you, half, my, half of what, I, what ends up thrown onto YouTube are talks I've given where I am trying to convince people not only the public, but lawmakers and people in power, that investing in the frontier of science, 
however remote it may seem in its relevance to what you're doing today, is a way of stockpiling the seed corns of future harvests of this nation. And those seed corns, what they do is, whether or not you know it today, advancing a frontier, history has shown, has advanced the culture ever since the Industrial Revolution got underway. And we can speak more hegemonistically about it, that anyone who has embraced the powers of technology has enjoyed economic wealth, the, like, the likes of which the world has never seen, attendant with strength, strength of security, okay? And so people say today, they'll say, so suppose the next attack Terrorist attack is like a chemical attack. Do you call out the Marines, or do you get your best chemists to figure out what to do about that? There's a point where your weapons are not as useful as the brain of the scientist who you could bring to bear on the problem. And so I see science and technology and creative investments in it as the most significant in infusion to our economy that could possibly be conceived. The problem is it's not going to boost the economy next quarter. It's got a time horizon longer than most people have the patience for, and most politicians have the re-election cycle to be tolerant of. So what we need is a longer view on those investments. I don't want to have to have NASA going hat in hand trying to get money to stimulate the frontier of cosmic discovery. And that frontier now involves biologists in the search for life, chemists in understanding the soils of Mars, uh, aerospace engineers. You know what I don't want to do? I don't want to stand in front of eighth graders and say, who wants to be an aerospace engineer so that you can design an airplane that's 15% more fuel efficient than the one your father flew? That's not going to get him. But if I say, who wants to be an engineer and design the airfoil that'll fly in the rarefied atmosphere of Mars, I'm going to get the best students in the class, and you know it because that's an exciting project for smart people to work on, motivated people to work on. And when you have them, they invent stuff. They discover things. They transform the culture in which we live on a time horizon that is not easy to just tell someone in a one-sentence soundbite. And what I want is a, a level of science and cultural literacy that will allow the public to be able to think beyond the election cycle, to think for themselves and say, this is a good investment. How many times have you heard people say, if you're not among us here, why are we spending money up there when we have the problems out here? Have you ever asked how much money we're spending up there? Ask that question. You know what the answer is? I've asked people, how much money do you think we're spending? Here's your tax dollar. How much do you think, 10%, 15%? Those are the kinds of answers I get. You know how much is getting spent? The rovers, the, the space station, the, 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 the space shuttles, all the launch vehicles, all the NASA centers is six-tenths of one penny on your tax dollar. Six-tenths of one penny pays for it all. And you're telling me, why are we spending money there and down here? If, if, if you need that money to solve these problems, you got some other problems going on, okay? That's a whole other problem with society. So, I, I'm sorry, I'm spitting, I'm getting off. So, my point is, I think the greatest, oh, <laughs> the, the greatest need is to be able to have the foresight necessary to make investments on the frontier of science, even if at the time you make those investments, you cannot figure out how that might make you rich tomorrow. Michael Faraday, in the 1840s, was the first one to pass a wire through a magnetic field. And it made a little meter tick on a, on a it moved a, 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 a meter. He hooked up to it. Now this guy, you do this and this happens. That's kind of cool. If you're nerdy, it's a, it's a, to a nerd, that's a cool thing, right? You do this and this happens. <laughs> and so what was happening is it induced a current through the wire. He showed his colleagues. It looked like just kind of a curiosity, a toy. Showed it to Parliament. They say, why, is this what we're funding? We're funding this toy? And this may be apocryphal, but it is said of Faraday in response to this inquiry, said, because they asked, well, what value is this to the British Empire? and to the king. He said, I don't know what value it is today, but I know one day you're going to tax it. <laughs> and in fact, that is the foundation of how all electricity is made today. <laughs> and it would take another 60 years before electricity would come to homes. But who could have known it at the time? I don't want to be left behind. I don't, I don't, stop, stop, stop. 
<laughs> I will not leave you behind. And last thing I'll say. Yes. Last thing I'll say. My, the biggest news story last year to me was not the methane uh, flatulence. No. The biggest news story happened December 22nd, something like that. I forgot what day. A press release comes out. Russia says they want to send a mission to deflect Apophis, the killer asteroid. Oh, yeah. By the way, I said if that hits, it's going to hit the Pacific, which affects us. Okay? Russia says we're going to launch a mission. We're going to start designing it now. We're going to fund it. Oh, by the way, the United States is welcome to join us. And people say, that's nice. A little international thing. I'm saying, wait a minute. Something's wrong here. <laughs> Aren't we the ones who are supposed to be starting missions and then invite other people to join us? Isn't that how it's been? So that was a sign, one of many, that our significance and meaning on the world stage is fading. And it's fading fast. And the, it's not a cliff. It's just a fade. And the day will come where the rest of the world just makes their own decisions about the future of their own space exploration and technologies. And we're sitting back saying, hi, fellas, can we join along? Neil, we already proved we can deflect asteroids in the movie Armageddon. Yes. <laughs> That's, so there's our fantasy. We don't do it in real. We do it on the silver screen. And we're happy about that. Maybe we've got to fix that disconnect. L last question. Why is there something instead of nothing? <laughs> Ten words or less. <laughs> Just because... So I got to do this in haiku then. Okay. Um, okay, five, seven, five. <laughs> Uh, words that make questions <laughs> may not be questions at all. <laughs> I am well rebuked. Neil DeGrasse Tyson, it is an honor to have you here and an honor always to talk to you. Please, come on, give it up for Neil DeGrasse Tyson. Thank you.